Good morning. Um, what Dan didn't tell you is that I haven't actually done this in a while. Um, God called me into ministry a, a long time ago, and uh, things have happened, and some of you know a little bit of my story. I, I got to meet some of you at a men's retreat. I, I think it was back in 21, 22, something like that. I don't remember exactly which year it was. Um, but I shared a little bit of my testimony uh, then, or at least what had happened right before that. And so for those of you who don't know, and there's a point to telling you now, um, I, I lost my first wife to a, um, a disease that nobody understood. Um, and I say that mostly as an introduction because I want you to know that God is the God, he is the redeeming God. He is the healing God. And I say that because that is the only true introduction I can give to you, my family. And I have a picture up here. They're in the back. Um, but my wife, uh, I, we got married uh, just over a year ago. We met um, and knew that we were going to get married in three months. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Not three months, dear. Three weeks. <laughs> in three weeks... We knew we were getting married. On week five, I was away on a business trip and I was able to pick out a ring um, in a foreign country and, uh, and all that. And we got married eight months later and started our family. Uh, and so this is my wife, Lauren. Um, and again, I cannot tell you just how much uh, of the redemptive nature of God has been displayed in my relationship and my marriage with her. Um, my health has improved simply by who she is, not by nagging and telling me to get off the you know, fast food. She just simply says, when I say, uh, what do you think about Whataburger? She goes, ew. <laughs> and, and so I take that to mean that I shouldn't tell her when I eat Whataburger. No, I mean that I don't, <laughs> I, that I shouldn't actually eat Whataburger, right? Um, and so just a whole bunch of different things. Uh, she and, and my son, now our son at the time, fell in love. This is Carter. He's the, the taller one. He's our older one. Um, he's seven years old uh, as of January. And I could not tell you how proud I am of him. You know, as a father, you know, just watching your, your boy and, or your, your children grow up. I don't have a daughter, so I can't tell you what it's like raising a daughter, but Dan can. And watching my boy grow and, and learn new things and do new things and, and then all the discipline things that come with that, that's been fun. Um, but I can't tell you just how proud I am of that. And then, of course, we have our, our youngest. This was quite a few months ago. If you see him now, he, he just looks like a mini giant. Um, but his name is Trace. He's five and a half months now. Um, so he's still kind of brand new to this world. And uh, anyway, I'm just very, very excited to have them uh, here. This is actually my wife's first time to get me, uh, get to listen to me preach. And so since this has uh, <clears throat> historically been kind of the thing that I've done, whether to youth or whether getting to preach in front of a, um, uh, adults or teach classes, uh, I'm just really excited about that. Um, God has me in a different season right now, so I'm not in active vocational ministry. Uh, I'm helping a family, my family business um, uh, with management and stuff like that. But part of that calling to do that was so that I could just come and uh, answer the call when people like Dan say, hey, do you want to preach? Or do you need help leading worship? Or do you want to teach something? And I just did to go, yes. Uh, and all the finances are all taken care of and, and everything else. So uh, I'm just excited about where God has. We're regrowing. We're, we're, my, our family is coming together. And I, I look forward to seeing the opportunities that he has for us in the future. Because my wife is a nurse, um, but she went on um, missions for a few years uh, in Haiti and Dominican Republic uh, to do medical missions there. And so we're just... Every day we talk about just the dream of getting to do more and more things for God together. Uh, and right now that's raising our children. And uh, anyway, that was a long introduction, but guess what? I'm proud of them. So uh, I'll tell you the other thing that I'm proud about is every time I get to come back here. Uh, Every time I, I'm asked to either come back or I, I just get a chance to visit some friends in the neighborhood, I always think back, man, how long ago was it that I was on staff at Leon Springs? And now it's 12 years, 12 years. And I'll tell you that I was only at Leon Springs for three and a half years, which seems so crazy to me and to sometimes the people that I'm talking to that knew me back then, because it was such a formative time 
in my life and in my ministry. Um, Dan and I became very close while on staff and as friends. And, you know, he got to go to the Mojave Desert. Uh, we used to do something a little bit more humble um, and whenever we wanted to go and just seek the Lord. We went all the way to Guadalupe State Park. Uh, and I think it was in the summer, so it was pretty hot. You know, we just really let the Lord cleanse us and, and teach us. Um, <clears throat> but it's always exciting to be back here because every time I come back, I just feel like as a church, I, I come home. And I get to say that not even knowing so many of you anymore. After 12 years, so many faces have changed. Um, some of my youth, one of my, my, uh, my ex-youth, Tori came up to me this morning like, this is my husband. Well, hello, husband, right? <laughs> you know, it, it's just so amazing to watch what God continues to do in this place and in this church. Um, one of the big things that I always enjoyed uh, about Dan and his directness, if you know Dan well, you know he's sort of direct. He, he doesn't know how to kind of talk around things all that often. Um, but one of the things that, and so he, he comes up with these lines and, and he came up with this line one time that he didn't actually come up with. I, I realized it's just in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> I give him too much credit sometimes. But he talked about wanting to be a church and a people full of truth and grace. Have y'all heard him say that ever? Using those two words? Well, it turns out that in John chapter one, that's the way John describes Jesus. Jesus came to be full of truth and grace. And so it, that impact, that one little phrase impacts me so much and, and I try, and I don't always get it, especially with my own kids, but I try and present the scripture in a way that, that says, God loves you, God wants to redeem you, but guess what? There's some pretty hard facts in here that we need to take advantage and, and look at. And so today is gonna be a little bit more of a harder message. If you were coming to feel good about yourself, well, I'm sorry, a little bit. But the Lord is really going to, to nail in on one thing, uh, and it, it's a very serious thing, because uh, it applies to us that love church. Raise your hand if you love church. I like interaction, right? I love God's people, and if you're thinking of it in terms of God's people and how he moves and how he works, I love that. I'll tell you that being on staff for years, not just here, but in other places, and also getting to watch behind the scenes, sometimes there's some things that are full of discord in church. I don't love that. I don't love that part of it. I never wanted to be a part of it. Sometimes you call it church politics. If you've ever gotten to watch church politics play out, I don't love it, but I love God's people I love God's word. I love watching God change people from the inside out. We, the youth ministry way back when was called what? The inside out ministry, right? And it was founded actually on a, uh, one of the gospel verses that says, it is warning to the Pharisee. You white, whitewash the outsides, but inside you're dirty. Wash the insides and the outside will, taken, will be taken care of. It'll be clean. And that's just talking about Jesus wanting to change our hearts more than our actions. The actions come after the heart is changed. So today, as we begin to look, the title of the um, message, and the one thing I just wanna be clear about, even when I did preach a lot, I was not good at developing slides for you guys. Um, so I may skip ahead, um, I, I don't know, but, I hope that they provide some sort of benefit as we walk through this scripture. Um, we're in Luke chapter 13, and I really appreciate Dan asking me to, uh, to preach, and I even more appreciate that he said, hey, we're in a series, I'd like you to just participate in the series uh, and go through the scriptures rather than choosing your own topic. And the reason for that is it's a whole lot easier for me to look into the text and go, okay, they've been here, we're doing this, than for me to go, I haven't been there in 12 years, well, really two, but I don't know where everybody is at personally. I just know what the scripture is saying and get to look at the context and share that with you now. And so we're in Luke chapter 13. I know that Dan preached on repentance. I even uh, chose to watch it so that I could be filled up a little bit. And he talked about repentance being a change of the mind. It, it didn't necessarily have to do with the action, but it was a change of the mind. and and. What we have to understand is as 
Jesus is talking, uh, I believe it was back in Luke chapter nine, uh, Luke tells us that he was on his way to Jerusalem. So he's going around talking, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and Luke is telling this, if you go all the way back to chapter one, to Theophilus, um, so that he may know the things that he has been taught, so he can be certain of those. And so as we look at this, I, I sort of wanted to look at it in terms of that you may know that what Jesus is saying and what he does and how he describes it, this is Jesus being fully and utterly true. Luke went back and he checked with the sources. He checked with the people that were walking with Jesus at the time. And he writes us to the office, this is true. And there's grace, but there's also a hard truth that we're going to look at. So we're gonna start in, in Luke chapter 20, uh, 13, starting in verse 22, we're gonna look at sort of two sections of scripture through this. And the subtitle of this is, is in what do you trust? You know, if I said in who do you trust, you might think of our coins and it says, in God we trust, right? And for people that are very proud to, to answer that, I, I'm excited about that, in God we trust. However, sometimes what we do in church is we, we begin to veer away from the foundational truths that Jesus has spoken, that he's taught, and we get caught up in either what kind of music it is or we get caught up in what kind of uh, administration is going on or what the color of the cement is. It used to be carpet, you know, when I was a kid. But here it's cement, right? What, are we gonna do traditional music versus non-traditional music? Is the, uh, is the pastor gonna preach and, and be uh, dynamic or is he too soft-spoken? Um, we, we've turned it into over, well, it's probably been this way really since the beginning because we're human. We've turned it into the preference for how we want to receive Jesus rather than allowing Jesus just to speak to us from his word in a foundational way. And what you have to understand is I grew up Southern Baptist in a, my, my first 10 years was in Houston at, at a place called Lazy Brook Baptist Church and we had a pastor, his name is um, Dr. J.K. Minton. I can't tell you a bad thing about growing up in that church. I loved it. The people were great. That was the type of church where my parents formed the relationships that I formed here, right? So I, I can look back and go, there were great things happening in that church. So I, I've grown up in church ever since I was two. Uh, when we moved out to a different church, uh, I remember all the, all the people who spoke into my life and led me and taught me and guided me to Christ. There were wonderful things happening. But what I can also tell you is that behind the scenes and that the fights would start, that the bickering would start. And I'm not gonna get into all the things that why they were started, I just know that as a kid, specifically from the age 10 to probably 20 something before coming here, my biggest reference in my formative years for church was to watch people fight. And I watched staff members who didn't like each other. And one of the things I always wondered is how on earth do you expect for Jesus to do his work in a church where the, the youth pastor and the pastor don't like each other? How does that even work? Where is the love of Christ? So what I, I say that because I want you to understand that my life was not full of sex, drugs, rock and roll and Jesus saved me and I was about to die and there's some great testimonies out there where God has pulled people out from the roughest of lives. I didn't have a rough life. I had a great life. Right, I wasn't silver spoon fed. I was, you know, we were middle of the road socioeconomically, all of that. But ultimately, I did not grow up with a life with problems. My brother and my sister and I were just not the type that wanted to get in trouble, so we didn't get in trouble as kids. Um, I remember my dad yelled at us three times. I say this a lot if you've ever heard me, but my dad yelled at his kids three times. It turned out it was all three times at me. I have a little bit of a stubborn streak. Um, and so that stubbornness got me in trouble once or twice. I wasn't saved from the depths of despair. What I was saved from was growing up in a church and never realizing who Jesus was. And I would have become what we can call today a church man. 
I could, have, I could have risen in the ranks. I could have become the deacon. I could have become the worship leader. Whatever, whatever path would have been taken, I could have said all the right things and, and I would have enjoyed every minute. I could have, you know, whatever. I could have even preached. I could have become the pastor. And I can say all this because I can think back to some, at least one guy who did exactly that. I, I won't speak to his salvation. I can only tell you that I know what his private life was versus his public life. And he enjoyed being the guy, right? And I'm telling you, I would have enjoyed being the guy. I very much enjoy not being the guy now. I really do. I love the fact that most of my life, I go to work, I see about eight people, I come home and, and, and my life is mostly about my family. It doesn't mean I don't love ministry and I wanna share the word, I absolutely do. My wife and I talk about what God might do in the future. I've already said that. But I was saved from being the churchman, the unsaved churchman. And I think there's a lot more pity in the person who thinks they're walking in life and grace than it is for the guy who realizes his despair and needs Jesus. And so this is the warning that we're gonna see today the primary warning that as we look at the scripture, if you absolutely love church and you love the people and you love how you do things and you love this and that, I'm gonna invite you as we read the scripture to examine your heart and ask you, what is it that you're trusting? Are you trusting in the church? Are you trusting in the man, Dan? Are you trusting in your friends here? Are you trusting in the Bible studies? Or are you going back to the very beginning and trusting in Jesus Christ? that he's the one doing the work in you and that you get to participate with other believers as he does the work in them and you get to enjoy them and, and fellowship with them. The koinonia, Dan says, that's the big word for the year, koinonia, which really just means that purposeful fellowship that's all pointed to Jesus. Okay, so I've already preached the whole sermon. Now we'll look at the text. Verse 22 so he was passing from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, so this isn't a disciple as far as we know. This is just someone who's been walking with him. It says this is, Lord, are, we there, are there just a few being saved? Now this is a powerful, powerful question. Are there just a few being saved? When I went and tried to look at it in the Greek, my Greek is a little rusty, but it's almost as if it didn't have to be a question. It could have been an observation. So he's walking with Jesus. He's watching Jesus preach and teach and do miracles. And he's watching people respond. And he, he's probably thinking, why are only a few getting saved? What's going on? And so Jesus' response is key here. He just tells this person, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able this is the biggest warning that we have for church people. And I say church people, I pray it's the people of God I'm talking to. But I don't know where you're at, I don't know where God has brought you. And so I'm just going to preach the scripture here. Jesus says, many, many will not enter. There is a narrow door. And if we look at this vast range of especially kind of Western churches, um, because that's what we have access to, to on YouTube and we can watch on TV. And, and if you just look at that vast majority, we try and make it as easy as possible for you to get to meet Jesus, right? And I don't have a problem with making it simple for you to have an interaction with Jesus. But there comes a point where you have to ask yourself, did you really true truly have a faith in Jesus or did you have an emotional experience? We have to be careful with the distinction between those two. I love, I love worship, right? I love the music and I love the fact that we have extremely talented people such as the people on this band, Tim. I only know Tim a little bit in small interactions but I know his reputation from different people. I know that he loves worship and I know that he loves teaching people how to do music and instruments. And guess what? Music is one of those great things where we get to praise God and we get to sort of release our emotions, right? I love these things. But I've also been to a place where I watched a guy preach and he got the music going and he got the beat going and he, you know, he just got it done in such a right way that he could get people to do whatever he wanted them to do. 
music is powerful. So we have to be careful that whatever our experience has been as we come to church and as we read the scripture, that we didn't just have an emotional response because of the environment. The environment is supposed to direct us to Jesus, not to control us, right? And so we have to be careful because there's going to be people who are probably in this room that think that we have done everything right, we've been a good person, we've gone to our Bible studies, we've gotten our theology right, and yet at the end, we're gonna see Jesus say, many will not enter. Let's look at the two things that he sort of points out with his parable here. He says in verse 25, once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, you should begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. So the first thing I want you to see out of this scripture is that one day he's going to shut the door. If you have been sitting there going, yeah, I like Jesus. I wanna give over my relationship to Jesus. I wanna trust him, but I'm just not sure. Just know that one day you won't have the opportunity anymore to make that decision. One day you're going, he's going to shut the door. And so that's why the Bible says that as long as today is called today, answer. Answer and place your trust in him now. And he will say, I do not know where you are from. And so they'll, they'll then beg a little bit more. In verse 26, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. That's the part that gets me for us as church members, as church goers. That sometimes it is easy for people who don't really want to give over, but they, they think that they should. So they go to church and they do all the right things. They they were there when he taught in the streets. They were there when he performed miracles. They listened to him. They even probably thought, man, he has a good point. Maybe I'll think about that a little bit, right? How often has, have I, I listened to pastors and they, they preach so well and, and I, oh man, that's a good point. I'll, I'll think about that. Maybe I'll put that into practice later. We have a big warning that Religious, and maybe it's up here. Yes, religious participation does not equal salvation. That's probably gonna be the biggest part of this message that I want you to understand because my heart has always been not, I, I'm not the, the evangelist that goes out necessarily and goes to the street. God has given me a heart for those who are in church, who struggle, who sit in there and go, something doesn't always add up. Or, they're sitting there just blinded to their own sin. And so I'm asking you, if, if, if you examine your heart today and you look at yourself and say, have I been blinded my said, let the Holy Spirit be the one that convicts you. I'm not here to convict you. I, I don't know most of you, and the ones I do know, I'm not gonna sit there and tell you how horrible of a person you are. I'm not saying anybody's horrible, but what I am saying is that there is a standard to enter in the kingdom of heaven and if we do not meet that standard, and I'll talk about what the standard is in a second. If we do not meet that standard, we will not enter. And of course, Jesus already pointed out the standard that you will know me. In the book of John, Jesus says, this is eternal life. You know, one of the big hope that we have is that when we die in this world, we're, we're not dead, right? We have eternal life with Jesus Christ, with God, the Father, and we get to enjoy him in his presence for eternity. But he says, this is enjoy, eternal life that you may know God and his son whom he sent. That doesn't have to wait for after we die. That's now. Eternal life starts when we get to interact with and get to see Jesus working in our lives in a real and tangible way. And Jesus' response to those who believe that re religious participation was enough in verse 27, he will say to them, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. And I think that's a hard thing. If, you've, if, you, if you're one, one that grows up in church or two, you were drawn here simply by friendship but never really got into the word. And all of a sudden you spent a lot of time going to church on Sundays and going to Bible studies, but you never let Jesus change your heart and change your life. It's a hard thing to get to the end of the line and at the beginning of eternity and Jesus to say, I don't know you. 
you're an evildoer, depart from me. But what's the key? I need to make sure I'm on, what time do y'all end? I could talk forever, guys. <clears throat> Sometimes I go really, really short. I told Dan that, uh, that I've typically gone just, well, here's the scripture and we're done, but, um, but I really want you to understand this, and, and this really is my passion um, out of this particular scripture to see God change the hearts of those who think that they're doing the right stuff but haven't engaged in Jesus. The key is this little term called faith. It's actually a couple of slides ahead. What, we're gonna get back to the next passage because I asked Dan if I could teach both of these passages um, just because of the answer that Jesus now gives to someone else. Um, so we're gonna go on to verse 31. Verse 31 and we're skipping down. I'm sorry, I wanna read through 28 just so that we get the full thing. In that place there will be the weeping and gnashing of teeth where you will see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God but yourselves being thrown out. Remember, he's talking to Jews primarily, right? So there is a lot of identity built up in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and they think that they're carrying on the work especially Pharisees and Sadducees and the, the lawyers and the leaders of the church, they, they have good intentions to try and carry on the work that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were called to in the beginning. And what they don't realize is that somewhere between the exile back in um, the Old Testament and by the time Jesus comes along, that religious uh, group of people who said, you know what, we're just going to point ourselves back to God, eventually the human nature started taking back over. They wanted control over it. They wanted to expound on Jesus. They wanted to, and so they came up with new laws to try and explain things. And they got so out of whack that now the Pharisees are against God instead of for God. If you've never heard this, the Pharisees started out as a force for good, not as a force for evil. If we read the scriptures right now, we, we look at it and we go, oh, the Pharisees are the enemy of God. Well, they weren't in the beginning. And so it's easy for us to start off with a heart that says, I love Jesus, I want Jesus, I wanna go out and change the world. And then the daily grind in church life and everything else that all of a sudden we, we start veering off into this other side of things where we try and control what's happening instead of letting Jesus do the controlling. Be careful that it's not you or that it's not me. And he ends in verse 30, and some will be last, or the last will, who will be first and some of the first will be last. Verse 31, we'll move on to the next part. Jesus, just at that time, some Pharisees approached saying to him, go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now this is a Pharisee who wasn't concerned for Jesus' safety. He was trying to use that as a way to get him out of the area because he wanted his control back. And so Jesus has a pretty neat reply and the way he replies will give us a little bit more context into the key to entering in the kingdom of heaven. He says, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and I perform cures today and tomorrow and on the third day I reach my goal. And with Easter coming up, if I said, what's Jesus' goal? I bet you would answer the resurrection, death, burial, and resurrection. He reaches his goal in Jerusalem when we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we do that because that is the key point in history where death was conquered and life was truly offered to us. There's a but though. That's not all Jesus did. Jesus came with a more complete purpose than just being the sacrifice for our sins. In fact, Jesus began his ministry. Oh, this is the great thing. Yeah, Jesus' purpose cannot be thwarted. I told you I'm not good with lining up to my notes. He's telling, he's telling the Pharisee, just leave me alone. I got, my, I got my job to do. So his purpose is not gonna be thwarted, but his purpose encompasses more than the end. He came first to preach the kingdom of God is at hand, right? So look at all these things. First, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. And I, I pulled all of these out of Luke. Since y'all are going through Luke, I decided to pull these scriptures directly from Luke. I usually like going back and forth, but I want y'all to see. Good news to the poor, liberty to the captive, sight to the blind. That's the kingdom of God. He's preaching the hope that's in Luke 4. He starts to demonstrate the power of God, 
right? He does the miracles. He casts out demons. That's just in this chapter where he's talking about right here. I cast out demons. I heal the sick. Because he's got to demonstrate the fact that his authority comes from God the Father himself. This is part of his purpose. He calls sinner to repentance. You, you heard about repentance last week. You cannot follow Jesus without repentance. Okay? If you stick to your direction and, and your control over your life and you don't submit to God the Father, it starts with that change of mind like Dan said, but that submission requires an actionable faith. He calls sinners who know that they are sick, who know that they are desperate, who know they need a change. In fact, one of the passages up there is, I don't call the righteous, he's talking to Pharisees, but I call the sick. I don't call the well, I call the sick. He is calling those who understand we need a savior. And he calls them to repentance. And then once they believe, he's calling to obedience. And this is one of those touchy subjects where we like to argue in the Christian world. Lordship salvation versus free will salvation. Guess what? The Bible teaches both. So if you're just one that likes to have that discussion, that's great. But realize that God has called our will to obedience. And repentance and obedience are the effects of something called faith. Faith is that trust in God. Repentance says, well, I'm on a cliff. I'm about to fall over and I need a savior. And Jesus says, I will save you. Do you trust me? All you have to do is reach out and grab me. His offer is easy. It is there. But it has to be an intentional, yes, Lord, I will turn from my ways and begin turning to your ways. And then, of course, at the end of his earthly life, he becomes the atoning sacrifice. But we have to understand that Jesus taught for three years about what the kingdom of God was and how we are to respond to God and how we're to respond to each other and, and just what all that means. And so one of the difficulties, I think, especially sometimes as we, we have our calls to faith, we forget sometimes to call people to trust in all of who Jesus was. We want to simply say, I trust that Jesus saves me. I'm gonna live my life now. But the call to faith was to follow him, to trust him in everything that he's teaching. In, in Matthew chapter 28, the great commission, go therefore to all nations, making disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey. And so I'm not advocating for you have to do something to be saved because the Bible is very clear that it is through faith we are saved by grace. By the grace of God, he has given us the faith to exercise and enter into the kingdom of heaven. However, many times we walk away from that idea of faith and we take control over the morality of our lives, over the control of the church, over the ins and outs of everything going on and we forget to say, God, your way, not my way. And as he tells them, I got all this to do. Go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons, perform cures, and tomorrow and the third day I reach my goal. His purpose is complete. That reaching my goal is that idea of running a race and getting to the end. But the fact is, is you, if you don't run the race, but you enter into the goal, then you didn't run the race. You're just a cheater, right? Because the purpose is the race. The purpose is the fullness of everything that Jesus has done. And so I wanted to point that out, that it's not just in the end and it's not just in the beginning. That's why it's very difficult for what they call Christers, those who come to Christmas and those who come to Easter. It's, it's very difficult for them to have an active, loving, faithful relationship with Jesus Christ because they're not looking at the whole of Jesus Christ. They're looking at the, oh, we have a sweet baby who's gonna become a king to, hey, he died on the cross for me, that's good. I'd like to go into heaven. And we forget all the stuff that he's actually called us to faith and follow. And so, if you can go on to the next one, I'm just gonna sort of explain this part and, and wrap up. 
this, this little phrase, God's part, uh, our part, or God's part, my part, came into um, my knowledge and awareness probably just over the last year. And really all it does, it means that uh, in everything that we have to focus on, everything that we have to do, and, and how we're going to respond to Jesus and how we're going to make our decisions, we have to realize that there's two parts in everything. There's God's part and there's our part. And it becomes really silly a little bit when we realize that God does everything and we do only one thing. I mean, it might look like a different like a, a lot of different things go a lot of different pathways, but there's really only one thing. And, and that one thing is we respond to Jesus in faith. In fact, I was talking to Dan about this this morning. When I learned to try and evaluate myself and let the Holy Spirit say what he needs to say, um, <clears throat> one of the things that came to my attention a while back is a passage in Romans chapter 14 that it actually defines sin you know, a lot of times when we say we want to get rid of the sin in our life, we want to repent of the sin in our life, and, and then we don't have a very clear definition of that. You know, it's, it's, well, we miss the mark, or it's doing something bad, or it's breaking but God's law, but maybe we don't know all of God's law, right? Maybe we haven't read the scripture, maybe we're brand new. But Romans defines sin as anything not done in faith, it's a simple definition and it's a powerful definition. And of course, in our sort of the way we talk today, I would even encourage you, every time you see the word faith, substitute it for trust. Because we understand trust. We understand the idea that if I don't trust the person next to me, whenever we're on, you know, trying to commit something, that we're probably gonna fail. We understand trusting as the terms of, you know, the old, the chair thing, you know, if we don't ever sit in the chair, we don't trust it, right? We trust our builders. We trust the people who have uh, our doctors. We trust our lawyers. And we all trust them in their specialized fields. But when it comes to Jesus, he says, we trust faith. Anybody who comes after me must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow after me. Not me, but Jesus and so when we take that definition of sin and we convert it to, am I trusting in Jesus in this moment? I don't have to have the answers. Whatever the big life decision is, you don't have to have the answers because God will guide you. Our part is always trust. God's part is to have the plan. God's part is to have the way. God's part was to bring salvation and healing and liberty to the captives. God's part is to f renew you, to build you up, to give you an abundant life. But our part is to simply say, yes, Lord. And if we stop saying yes, Lord, in the pursuit of all these other things that we think were good, we, have, we, we run that possibility of maybe we didn't actually ever believe Maybe we just sit there and go, well, yeah, I, I like church. I feel good at church. The pastor either gives me a good message or maybe he convicts me. And I think, do y'all know that sometimes conviction just feels good? It feels good to be told no and that you're wrong and you can change a little bit. And so either we get convicted or we get lifted up. And at the end of the day, if it's not a response to Jesus, if it's only a response to a principle that Dan has taught or that whoever else has taught, it's not faith. So be careful how you're responding and where your heart condition is because that's going to determine your relationship with Jesus. That simple word faith, trusting, right? And so I just, faith is an act of trust in the teaching, the power, and the work of Jesus Christ. Not just the work of Jesus Christ, but the teaching and the power and the work. Faith in action is just those two simple words of repentance and obedience. If you don't ever wanna obey what the scripture has in front of you, it's not faith. Sometimes I want to obey and I don't know how or I find it difficult or I get dragged back into my, my muck and my mire. That doesn't mean you don't have faith. It means you're struggling, right? I'm not trying to take away the struggle because we're sinners who are being redeemed by the great redeemer. 
But if you just blatantly go, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, I know the Bible says it, but I'm not gonna do that. It's not faith. And faith is the key to the kingdom of God. Jesus provided the way through the cross, through the resurrection. We're gonna celebrate that in a few weeks as a universal church in all of our different locations. But as you prepare for that, I strongly urge you to examine your hearts and say, what am I trusting in today? What have I trusted in in my life? Especially if you grew up in church. I want to ask you if there's even a possibility or a remote possibility that, that your time in church has been all about you and all about the experience and the environment or has it been about Jesus? If it's about Jesus, then fantastic. I'm gonna invite the band, Tim, to come back up. I believe we're gonna have a moment, uh, a time to respond. Um, maybe some people up here ready to pray with you. But in this time where, where he just sort of plays some music and, and we, we wrap up, I wanna encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit, where is my heart right now? Am I walking in faith to who you are and to what you've done, or am I not? And if I'm not, Lord, convict me, mold me, change me. Thank y'all for letting me share God's word. I'm gonna pray real fast and then let the response time take over. The Bible says that God is working all around us and God is working in you. So I wanna urge you to respond to God's truth. And if you're looking for a church home at Leon Springs Baptist, we are a healing place in this hurting world. We're equipping people to serve God. And I want to end by saying, God loves you and you can trust in the goodness of God. Thank you for joining us.